Okay, well, hello everyone uh, and uh, welcome to our panel on voter engagement and participation. Thank you very much for, for joining us today. Uh, we have a very exciting and interesting uh, group of papers ahead of us today. So um, just before getting started, a quick reminder that the presentations are going to be recorded and um, we will have 10 minutes, 10, 13 minute presentations from, from our um, panelists today. And that will be followed by uh, our discussant, Clement. Thank you very much for, for joining us uh, today. And uh, finally, at Q&A, we have opened the um, chat in the Zoom call. So if you feel like uh, starting a conversation there that has worked really well in other panels, and I've just heard really good positive feedback about that. So let's start uh, talking there. And uh, then for me on my side, let's, let's get started. We can begin with our first presentation following the order of the program. Uh, that would be voting rights for persons with disabilities in the European Union, where do we stand? So Armin and Michael, whenever you want to get started, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, thank you very much. Um, let me just share the screen for the presentation. And I hope... Uh, it works out. And, uh, okay, I think it should, should be fine. So yes, good uh, afternoon, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be on this panel. And uh, I would like uh, together with my colleague, Mike Leder, present uh, the findings of our comparative research regarding uh, the participation of persons with disabilities in European Parliament elections. Our colleague uh, Alejandro Maledo from European Disability Forum uh, is co-authoring the article we handed in and um, we also thank very much the European Disability Forum with whom we conducted this uh, research together and also their members in the various EU member states. Now, our key research question was to understand to which extent the European member states are implementing the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in their uh, respective territories for the European Parliament elections. So we looked into uh, this during the period October to December uh, 2021, and our departure is this uh, universal right uh, to participate in political and public life, which we have in the Universal Declaration of right, Human Rights, but we also have it and see it in the 1966 ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. But we focus particularly into the CRPD, as we call it, and here, especially the Article 29 provides for the uh, participation of persons with disabilities and guarantees their disenfranched, um, fully disenfranched, um, uh, their, their full right and no, without any disenfranchments and without any um, um, uh, uh, hindrance to the to exercise the right and the opportunity, the right to vote and the opportunity to enjoy those rights and participate fully in the electoral process of uh, their countries, but also at the European Union. And here it's important to say that also the European Union is a member to the CRPD, like all the 27 EU member states. Now what's in the CRPD, and I just would like to highlight few parts of this um, on the CRPD. So the first is that uh, persons with disabilities have the right to stand for elections, to effectively hold office and perform all public functions at all levels of government, facilitating the use of assistive and new technologies where appropriate. Further, to promote actively an environment in which persons with disabilities can effectively and fully participate in the conduct of public affairs without discrimination and on an equal basis with others. So that's really uh, fundamental. And we have also outlined in the article 
that there are um, other international organizations like the Venice Commission or the OECE, which have, uh, uh, or the European Court of Human Rights, which have a partly uh, deviating opinion on this topic, but we particularly think the CRPD is the international standards to go by. So it further, the CRPD further um, and should and and, uh, provides that member states should ensure that voting procedures, facilities, and materials are appropriate, accessible, and easy to understand and use. Uh, it's important that there's uh, also the protection of the right of persons with disabilities to, to vote by a secret ballot in elections and public referendums without intimidation, and that there is a free expression of the will of the persons with disabilities, and that they can, if uh, requested and required, uh, ask for assistance by a person of their own choice. Yeah, we will get back to that. Now, we looked at it from a comparative research perspective. And when it comes to the right to vote of persons with disabilities, we see that this is only provided for in 13 countries, yeah? So these are the light blue countries uh, um, which provide the full right to vote of persons with disabilities. We have in dark blue, those countries which uh, have uh, restricting the right to vote um, and to a certain extent. And then in orange, we have those seven countries, that's Estonia, Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, Greece, Cyprus, and Malta which are denying the right to vote to persons under guardianship. So it's especially this category of persons with disability, which are, are, have still no full political rights across the European Union. And then uh, uh, we see that there's the right to stand as a candidate, which is only upheld in eight countries. That's including Sweden, Germany, Denmark, Netherlands, Austria, Italy, and Spain. And in all other 19 countries, this right uh, is limited. Now, to understand the way European Parliament elections are held, it's important to underline that these are 27 parallel elections conducted by 27 European um, election management bodies in the various member states. So there are different ways of marking the ballot by an X, by a tick, or by a, using a stamp like in Romania, and or choosing a ballot, which is um, done in countries like Czech Republic, Spain, France, or Greece, Latvia, Sweden, and Slovakia. Um, let me stop here and hand over to my colleague, Mike Lidar, who will go more into detail in this respect. Michael, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Armin. So Armin's last slide has shown that, of course, different ways of voting uh, uh, indicate uh, different barriers of accessibility to the electoral process for persons with disabilities. And it's this accessibility principle that stems from Article 29 of uh, the CRPD that we want to look into a little bit further. Accessibility here is rather broadly defined. It includes accessibility to information, information shared by election management bodies, information shared or facilitated by political parties, including information and accessibility at campaign events. But for now, let's focus on the core element of this accessibility, and that is the accessibility of voting procedures. And with that, also look at what the CRPD calls reasonable accommodation. The CRPD sets forth this, these two principles of universal design, according to which a polling station or any element of the electoral process should be accessible to any voter uh, uh, equally at all times. Whereas reasonable accommodation speaks about measures where this is not possible. And this is in particular exercised through alternative and advanced means of voting, as well as assistive tools, as we will see, and finally, we will also speak about the free choice of assistance as put forth by Article 29 in that regard. 
So when it comes to the accessibility of polling stations, uh, the European Union shows a mixed picture. It is 18 EU member states that have direct or indirect legal obligations to actually ensure the physical accessibility of polling stations to uh, all voters on equal terms. Uh, where this is not the case, or to balance this further, there is reasonable accommodation, and uh, this is actually available in mem many member states. 23 EU member states have some form of alternative or advanced means of voting. We will look at what that can be. Uh, four countries do not have that, uh, notably France, Belgium, Greece, and Cyprus, with the exception that uh, um, France actually has a proxy vote, but that is not considered as, an, uh, 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 as a reasonable accommodation under the CRPD. So reasonable accommodation in terms of alternative and advanced means of voting could pertain to the possibility to change a polling station on election day, according to the wish of the voter, uh, the establishment of specific polling stations, especially for persons with particular needs, also the possibility of in-person uh, rather than by ballot, by, by mail-in ballot, in-person early voting. Uh, and all these can be measures that can also serve other voters, but can serve in particular voters with disabilities. Um, furthermore, there is the mobile ballot box. We have that in Austria to vote either from home in residential institutions or hospitals or even outside a polling station, as we have seen it in Croatia two years ago. And then uh, the possibility for voters with special needs to be transported to a polling station. Um, then there are a variety of assistive tools that you may have heard of, that is the use of braille font, large print and audio guides, tactile ballot sleeves or stencils, but also things as magnifying glasses, lamps, and writing utensils, the use of information in easy to read and sign language, and assistance and support while voting. We are coming to this. But we can see that uh, a number of member states, namely Bulgaria, Cyprus, Greece, Italy, Romania, Slovakia, and Slovenia, do not offer any of this. Now, in most member states, uh, voters with disabilities can choose uh, an assistance of their choice, while in Cyprus and Greece, this choice is limited to election officials. And all this, of course, pertains to the maintenance of the secrecy of the vote. This depends on the accessibility of polling procedures and the provision of reasonable accommodation. We have seen that the situation is still rather worrying in uh, uh, the cases of Bulgaria, Greece, Malta, and Cyprus, uh, where uh, there are questions around voting in residential institutions, there is a lack of assistive tools, or there are problems with the reasonable accommodation provided, or there is a lack of free choice of assistance, as we have shown. Now, with all this, while conducting this research with our network in all EU member states, we have seen there is actually, uh, there are actually changes going on and there are is advances in this domain due to the advocacy provided by various uh, DPOs, disabled persons organizations in the member states or at European level. And this advocacy has led to uh, additional 600,000 EU citizens already prior to the 2019 elections receiving the right to vote with a recognition of their, their full voting rights at that time. And this agenda uh, is, uh, is continuing with a growing number of good practices, but also with continued advocacy at European level. The European Elections Act is currently uh, uh, in an amendment process and there is still the possibility ahead of the 2024 elections to fully incorporate CRPD also in this at a legal basis. 
From our side at Election Watch U, we continue to monitor these processes. We aim again at observing uh, these levels of inclusion at the, the occasion of the 2024 European elections to assess then how much this, uh, these recommendations and uh, these uh, demands by uh, uh, DPOs have been uh, integrated in the European Elections Act, as well as in EU member state legislation. For now, we invite you to look at the report that Armin just had up our last slide, the human rights report that was uh, published by EDF, where you can see their existing recommendations, as well as a summary of our research to date. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for this very interesting pre presentation and such a, a valuable and important topic. Uh, you finished right on time. Uh, before moving on to, to the next presentation, just a quick reminder for, for all the participants that you can start asking questions and start a conversation through the chat. There will be a Q&A in time for a Q&A after the, all the presentations and discussions, but in case you want to start raising some points, I tend to forget if I don't write it down. So. It's a good way to, to get the ball rolling. And uh, now moving on to the next presentation, we have uh, Who Cares? The Age Gap in Voter Turnout Across Europe. Ayosan, if, if you are ready, whenever you want to share screen. Uh, good evening, uh, good afternoon. Uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to share, to present my, pre uh, my project. Well, um, Do you see it? Yes, you can see it. Yes, perfect. Okay. Um, my name is Ayojan Kamataeva. I'm PhD student, first year PhD student at Dosta University. Um, I'm uh, going to present uh, um, my research on contextual determinants of the age gap uh, in voter turnout across Europe. Um, uh, well, one of the uh, consistent findings uh, of electoral engagement is that younger citizens are less likely to vote than older citizens. So this behavior creates a turnout inequality between old and young citizens. Uh, so far, many studies mainly approach the issue using um, the American, British, and Canadian context. However, little is uh, known about whether their stories refer to the universal age gap or the age gap is restricted to certain countries. So this is gonna be my first uh, first research goal. Uh, the next is to explain why there is the, the age gap in voting most severe in some countries and not in others. Even though the individual level factors of political participation have been extensively examined, they don't exist in the vacuum. And there are socioeconomic and political policies that allocate resources and further shape individual level uh, perspectives. In other words, every single uh, ballot might have different costs across Europe, depending on welfare services and other institutional frameworks. And hence, uh, young and old people's political commitment might vary with the conditions. Uh, although the consideration of broader contextual determinants has gained wide currency in recent years, there is no consensus among scholars on what kind of contextual explanation might be most plausible, accounting for age effect on decision to drop their votes into the ballot box. I use this uh, life cycle and generational approaches to figure out relevant contextual factors on the basis of individuals, resources, and political socialization environment. Along with the literature um, on general macroeconomic regulations, electoral administration, uh, labor market and welfare state types, I chose three contextual determinants to test. Um, moreover, this, um, this um, contextual determinants, they uh, also allows, um, uh, also satisfy my goal to assess the effect of the recent crisis in Europe. So the, the research question of the paper is why um, is the age gap is smaller in electoral turnout in some countries than in others? And um, in this slide, I try to introduce briefly uh, these contextual determinants versus on economic downturn. So it's mainly based on resource-based participatory, participatory models. 
And the second one is an immigration uh, crisis that happened in 2015, 16. And then third one is democratic uh, backlash, uh, democratic backsliding. So which is going to take uh, democ democracy, the quality of democracy or the age of democracy um, as a main object. Um, and an argument that I'm going to develop in this paper underlines the importance of contextual determinants especially drawing on the silent revolution in reverse by Inglehart and effect of recent economic and immigration crisis and democratic backsliding, it's believed that um, it's going to shape the socioeconomic context of countries significantly and thus differently affect citizens' attitudes towards government, our own communities and incoming uh, migrants. In other words, uh, the external shocks might set a new trend in public attitudes by creating momentum based on both demand and supply side factors. So the interplay of these factors incentivizes one uh, to either vote or ignore the electoral politics. And here we can see the main hypothesis of the paper. Uh, the first is based on this economic downturn that it's believed um, the age gap is, uh, in turnout is going to be smaller in those countries which are heavily affected. And uh, in the second, it's going to be uh, on heavily uh, affected countries by massive migrants also to have smaller uh, age gap in turnout. And the last one is that the age gap in turnout is going to be smaller in those countries which are going to be established democracies than in new democracies. So the, the analysis focuses on uh, young respondents uh, uh, which are between 18 and 34 years old and the older 35. So I'm going to take the ratio of this. And main independent variables are set according to this uh, main independent, um, contextual independent variables. And um, geographical focus is going to take like 26 countries, mainly are the, these, those are available on uh, European Social Survey. And the, the time frame is uh, between 2008 and 2018. Um, so um, it can be observed that the age gaps are quite heterogeneous across countries, ranging from just under 2025 percent in Poland to almost 684 percent, with a mean around uh, 400. Uh, a grouping was made based on countries' macroeconomic, political, and geographical backgrounds to find special like uh, patterns. Overall, the story with Nordic countries seems coherent. Um, in contrast, the age gap in Western countries, um, Western European countries, is not homogeneous. And Belgium is here uh, has the lowest age gap, and this is one of the outlier countries. And the key and undoubtedly lies in this compulsory voting that contributes to higher and more equal electoral participation in this country. And whereas um, Great Britain, Ireland, and France, they have the highest age gap for all years. And the age gap is relatively low in the Central European uh, and South European countries with a few deviant findings and um, attempts to capture some tendencies through uh, general groupings have brought mixed results, uh, leading us to more detailed consideration of the contextual explanations in the following sections. So we can see that um, in general, uh, there are two main um, issues with running OLS regressions. So first is the problem of indigeneity and the second, the violation of independent and identically distributed observations. So in order to partially resolve these estimation obstacles, I used uh, fixed effects. And I can, we can see here the first three models uh, portray OLS coefficients and the uh, last three uh, on uh, fixed effects. So uh, we can see here the main three uh, variables, how they change uh, when, um, uh, how the, uh, the age gap changes when we have 1% change in these three uh, independent uh, variables. And we can see that in the share of immigrants, we find um, like a controversial result in OLS and um, fixed effects. In general, these three uh, show the significant effects. However, uh, in the discussion uh, here, I have more like um, extensive uh, discussion about the, the assumption of microeconomic uh, environment. It's not fully convincing. Uh, because um, I, I assume that it might be that 
the outcome might be affected by the automatic your level automatic stabilizers that immediately mitigate the impact of economic recessions and balance economic growth uh, among European countries. Nevertheless, government expenditure has a statistic, statistically significant effect on citizens' involvement in elections. However, the direction of the relationship does not support the, the current paper's uh, assumption. The result implies that the higher amount of government spending contributes to lower age gap in voting. Uh, while the findings suggest that the cut in the state budget is more likely to disincentivize only underprivileged social groups, thus widening the age gap. In line with this finding, uh, Radcliffe uh, highlights that the generous state benefits help to ease the burden of economic hardships on citizens' electoral engagement. And here um, uh, we can see uh, the relatively more stable and lower age gap between old and young citizens in, or in Nordic countries might probably be due to the generous social protection. The finding on governmental expenditure needs to be further examined, uh, taking into consideration uh, of these welfare models. Um, the immigration effect uh, is becoming somewhat ambiguous uh, because of this contradictory finding between OLS and uh, fixed uh, effects estimation regressions. And um, as fixed, uh, esti uh, fixed effects results have a positive effect, the finding is inconsistent with the paper's um, assumption. The finding suggests that higher share of migrants is associated with the slight increase in the age gap. Um, However, this ambiguity between outcomes leads us to three concerns. The first one is uh, the current way of measuring in the paper uh, might be misleading because the total share of migrants per country does not necessarily mean that these migrants are equally distributed within the country. For example, a few areas of Italy have the highest share of migrants compared to the rest. And uh, the public attitudes towards migrants and their vote choice might vary depending on the concentration of these migrants in their neighborhood. And the second is suggested earlier, the sample size is small and unequal. Unfortunately, some of uh, European social survey rounds lack data for uh, more exposed countries such as uh, Greece. And the thirdly, the mechanism of the immigration argument can be complicated because of uh, disregarded conf confounding factors like uh, the media consumption or the rise of uh, ra uh, radical right, right wing parties. And um, the argument on the age of democracy is compelling and also insightful. Interestingly, the findings suggest that the effect of this predictor is positive and statistically significant, meaning that established democracies are more likely to have a higher age uh, gap in voting. The direction of the relationship between main variables is the opposite to the one that I was mentioning in the hypothesis three. And relying on the previous findings, uh, we know that young people are more electorally active in older democracies than new ones. This re relatively smaller age gap in voting among new democracies can refer to the low electoral turnout for both age groups. So this is not surprising since, as earlier suggested, many new democracies might still preserve the legacies of the former system. The formal regime trans transition does not fully entail accepting democratic culture and setting in post-Soviet states, primarily if the new governing elite consists of the same members as those appointed to the former cabinet. In contrast, the relatively higher age gap in voting among old democracies can refer to the low electoral turnout for yes, young and uh, high electoral turnout for older people. For instance, in the paper, we can see um, uh, the figure one shows that the age gap is high in Ireland, in Great Britain and France. So there are some uh, articles that claim that the current generation of young people is very distant from electoral politics. So in, instead, uh, young people in advanced democracies are more inclined to engage with like uh, non-governmental organizational and non-institutional activities uh, compared to young people of the new established democracies. And uh, in general, uh, like uh, the existing literature says, this finding might be a symptom of democratic deficit in neglecting certain social groups and as a result to switching their participation channels to non-institutional ones. Um, however, this pattern uh, does not apply to all established democracies. 
For instance, the ratio between young and old voters is the most stable and lowest in Belgium, Sweden, Norway, and Denmark over the last decade. And uh, despite the persisting electoral volatility across Europe, electoral participation remains relatively stable and high in Scandinavian countries. Uh, because of this inconsistency among the established democracies, the coefficients of the predictor are negligible. And uh, this aspiration might be explained by the immediate re reaction to the issue instead of long waiting elections and the time consuming process of new government formation in these Scandinavian countries. Um, and uh, here I um, put the overall of this research that um, the first, uh, the goal, uh, the, according to the first goal, the, the character of the turnout inequality is not present with the same strengths everywhere. The second goal was that the state expenditure, immigration and the age democracy, they are statistically, uh, statistically associated with our research object. And the third, uh, some interactions on the period effect. Uh, we have considerable changes um, not occurred in 2009 and 2017 concerning the age gap in voting, which was like mainly to see the effect of the crisis. And in general, I highlighted some limitations and the further improvements. Uh, the first one was um, like the questions of internal validity and better strat strategy for assessing independent variables, uh, the effect of independent variables. So, for example, uh, the create, creating um, a macroeconomic index and, and also choosing, for example, better proxy for um, migration effect um, and then choice of contextual determinants and the role of social policies and the welfare state, like <clears throat> to better um, set the strategy um, to make the, the measure of the welfare state effect. But in that case, I assume that I would not frame my research as a, the effect of um, crisis, but more likely how the social welfare, social policies uh, cope with the, with the crisis in general. And it's going to be a bit different theoretical framework for the paper. Um, but at the same time, I also didn't uh, include some uh, control variables like the, the level of corruption and also the compulsory voting because I found some deviant cases or, or like um, the, the cases which don't fall in the same like story in the line of the story. So like, for example, Belgium. And also in general, uh, one of the main uh, disadvantage, like the, the weakness of the paper was small sample size. And also, um, initially, I was planning to run these regressions uh, by using multi-level modeling. Um, however, with the, the shortage of the time, I didn't um, fulfill this, this plan. Uh, so in general, I think that uh, multi-level model can change the results and uh, to make more um, like better outcomes um, uh, because of the hierarchical, hierarchical character of these uh, relationships. Um, individuals nested in countries and countries nested in years, and then also to see these uh, effects of crisis better. And um, also uh, another point for further uh, improvements, uh, like for further research uh, paper, it was on extrapolation to other political participation uh, modes. Um, like um, I only considered people voting or not voting, but um, it's very interesting to see uh, do people uh, who vote go for protest or those who are going to protest, they are not voting or they are doing both or uh, they're fully ignoring all these modes of uh, participation. So I think that um, this, um, the logic behind of the choice uh, among individuals in Europe, according, like based on their um, social background is very interesting to see this, um, this thing. Um, so this is basically all uh, about my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. For, for sharing your research and your results with, with us today. That was a very, very interesting, uh, very interesting presentation. Moving 
on now to to the next one uh, because we have little time and and a lot to discuss. Uh, the the next presentation is does uh, candidates diversity enhance voter democratic engagement? The case of candidate affinities on LGBTQ plus voter engagement and participation in Canadian politics. And we have Joanna Everett to present. Joanna, whenever you're ready to to share a screen. Okay, is that is that sharing me now? Yes. Um, yes. I can all see. right. I hope that's working. We don't see it in full screen yet. Okay. Yeah. Is that working? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So um, um, we see it with the with the notes. Just you see it with the notes. Yes. Well, there are no notes, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> Just to uh, let you know what we're what we're looking at. <laughs> let's just stop sharing this. Let's try this again. Um, my apologies. It worked last time. Um, Technology tends to stop working when you need it to to work, so it's <laughs> it's okay. It happens okay. to all of us. <laughs> so can you see it? Uh, we can see the whole the the, the whole PowerPoint. Yes. So we okay. can read your your slides. I can't see the whole PowerPoint. That's the problem. Um, okay. I am just going to make it big then. Um, let me pull this aside. There. Um, okay. So the um, paper today is interested in. Uh, electoral integrity from the, the focus of turnout. And we have seen over the years a uh, decline in turnout in democratic systems. Uh, it's a lot of a significant concern to political scientists. It calls into questions the integrity of electoral process. And many studies have attempted to try and sort of understand what factors might contribute to this. And one of the things that I'm interested in is, is diversity and diversity within our legislature legislative bodies and in the candidates that run for, for office. And the question that I'm looking at is, is it possible that as our societies become more diverse, and I'm thinking here of Canada, which is a, a highly diverse society, high levels of immigration, um, and yet our political system is still relatively homogeneous. It's still relatively white, male, and heterosexual. And so the question I have uh, driving this sort of research is, how might candidate diversity result in greater democratic engagement and electoral in integrity? So um, what we're looking at here is one part of a larger research project uh, that my colleagues uh, and I are working on to look at candidate diversity and its impact on turnout and political engagement. Um, we're looking at gender, indigenous, racialized candidates. And in this particular um, focus of the project, we're looking at sexual minorities. And one of the reasons that we're able to do this is that there have been recent increases in the candidacies of LGBTQ plus individuals in Canada. In 2021 election, there were 69 candidates running in 65 of the 338 ridings. And there's been a more recent attention paid to the political engagement of LGBTQ plus voters, but there's not been a lot that has been done in Canada. So we're entering this project with the expectation that LGBTQ plus voters who are in ridings in which they have a candidate who is also LGBTQ plus are more likely to uh, get out and uh, pay attention to what's going on and more likely to turn out to vote. I'm not interested in are they voting for those candidates. I'm interested in just having that candidate who you share an identity with stimulate your interest in the election and make it more likely for you to, to turn out to vote. And um, we're drawing on uh, affinity theories which suggests that um, we have these in-group biases, that when we are around, um, we have these biases towards people who are like us, who share uh, certain representational uh, qualities with us, and that when you have a um, higher descriptive representation, it results uh, of your particular identity, it results in higher levels of trust, efficacy, po political interest, group pride, and participation. So that when you have candidates like you who are running, particularly if you are in a historically underrepresented social group, you're more likely to become engaged with the campaign. Alternatively, if you don't see anyone like you out there running for political office, it might lead you to feel anxious, to feel less likely that this is a, something that for you to participate in and question your appropriateness in that arena. 
And so we would argue that it's likely to lead to lower levels of political turnout. It's kind of connected to linked fate arguments, but this linked fate argument is slightly different. Uh, this is also a feeling of closeness to somebody, uh, but it's the idea that uh, one's life choices are tied to the whole group and that uh, you are, your own fate is going to be uh, best uh, suited or uh, best looked after when your group is being elected. So there's a little bit of a uh, um, reactive type of response in that. So LGBTQ plus participants are typically higher than average voters. And for many, they've argued that this is a way of protecting hard won rights and policies from being erased or reduced. We're not um, trusting, we're not looking at this as much, but it's there as one of the potential theories that we're looking at. We're more interested, I think, in that sort of uh, the I theories that I mentioned earlier. One of the things that's unique about our study is that we're focusing on candidates versus elites. Um, the average local candidate is, is someone who's easier for voters to identify with. Um, Canada has a single member plurality system, so we're not voting for presidents, we're not voting for uh, the higher elected office, you're voting for your local candidate. And these local candidates are more approachable, less intimidating, more in common with the voters. And one of the challenges that uh, we face with this and looking at the LGBTQ plus community is that there are not very many elites that are out there who are LGBTQ plus. We have actually had uh, party leaders and premiers in Canada who are LGBTQ, uh, but uh, at, at the federal level, we don't. So in looking at this particular, we're looking at candidates and their impact. So in Canada, we have an increased number of, of candidates, 69 in 2021, yet they're still underrepresented in parliament, only eight of those got elected. We also are uh, advantaged in that we have a very large election study, Canadian election survey sample, uh, with oversampling and key writings, which allowed us to identify over 2,000 LGBTQ plus respondents of whom 633 were located in ridings that had an LGBTQ plus candidate. So we had these different elections going on across the country and we could test to see whether or not uh, having a candidate that you shared an identity with if you were LGBTQ plus made you more likely to turn out and vote. We also have a multi-party system with uh, four or five parties uh, depending upon where you are uh, and uh, many uh, minor or independent parties. So when we take a look at where those candidates run, uh, 41 of them ran for the NDP, 12 for the Liberals, 9 for the Green Party, uh, 4 for the Canadian, uh, Canadian uh, CPC, uh, yes, yeah, sorry, uh, the, the uh, Canadian Conservative Party, uh, the Conservative Party of Canada, sorry, that's how it is, uh, and um, the PPC, uh, People's Party of Canada, and the Independents, so those, those much smaller numbers. There was no party that was anti, obviously anti-LGBTQ, uh, and um, and so we were just not really sort of too concerned about whether they're running for parties of the right or left. In many senses, Canada is a hard case to look at. Um, our LGBTQ voters are typically highly engaged uh, and, and Canada is a comparatively friendly country for LGBTQ plus individuals, gained marriage rights and other, and other relationship rights very early on, uh, increasing uh, number, uh, range of trans uh, rights, general public acceptance and not a significant backlash against uh, LGBTQ plus individuals. So if candidate diversity has an impact on voter turnout under these conditions, it's likely to be very relevant for other underrepresented minorities and in other world contexts. So we have uh, four hypotheses that we're looking at here. First, that the, these voters are gonna um, demonstrate higher levels of turnout than other Canadians. Second, that this higher level of turnout will persist even with controls for age, university education, sex, income, and party identification, which are the common controls for turnout. Um, third, that LGBTQ plus identified voters in ridings with an LGBTQ plus candidate are more likely to turn out to vote than these same voters in ridings where there is no LGBTQ plus candidate. Fourth, it qualifies this a little bit and basically is saying um, when you have candidates who are actually viable, that are have a good chance of winning, you're gonna have higher turnout. When you actually have candidates that are not viable, who are run potentially as lost cause riding uh, candidates, uh, sacrificial lambs, or as fringe party candidates, that may in fact uh, suppress LGBTQ plus voter turnout because they see uh, their chances not being very strong and, and so you know why bother participating? So to talk a little bit about methods briefly, uh, this election survey itself had over 22,000 respondents. We're looking at those who are just LGBTQ+, so we're looking at uh, over about 2,000 respondents, eight, uh, about 12.8% of, um, of the survey who self-identified as LGBTQ+. 
we added in the data about the 69 candidates, uh, the riding that they ran for, the party that they ran for, and their electoral viability into this large uh, public opinion data set. Our dependent variables is turnout. We're looking at independent variables of the voter LGBTQ plus identification, the candidates LGBTQ plus identification, and then uh, that LGBTQ plus candidate viability. And then we audited, uh, included uh, obvious controls for education, age, income, respondents, party identification as either liberal conservatives or NDP as those were the parties that received most of the votes and, and uh, others were then control. So we set up three logistic, logistic regression models. Model one looked at just whether or not um, LGBTQ plus voters turned out higher in higher levels than other voters. Model two added in there uh, the measures for whether or not there was an LGBTQ plus candidate uh, running and whether or not there was an interaction between uh, the LGBTQ plus voter and the LGBTQ plus, LGBTQ plus candidate. And then our third model uh, removed the candidate and the interaction between the voter and candidate and included a measure of viability of that candidate. So did it matter whether or not that candidate was a viable candidate or not? So the results were, uh, to uh, hear, be clear quickly, uh, voters were more likely to turn out than others. So our hypothesis one uh, turned out true, our hypothesis two also turned out true because it this higher turnout level uh, continued when you, you controlled for all the other uh, um, typical control variables that might uh, affect turnout. Um, in our model two, in which we controlled for the candidates, uh, we found that turnout, the turnout coefficient decreases uh, for LGBTQ plus voters, and it was no longer statistically significant. Um, it still was large and it was very close to significance, but it didn't, it didn't actually reach significant common measures of significance. Uh, the interaction term was substantive and it reached only a, a P of uh, 0.07, so not quite normal levels, uh, but the results are in the expected direction and were close to significance. What's particularly interesting, I think, about our results is the impact of model three, in which we controlled for uh, LGBTQ plus candidate viability. And so in this case, our coefficients for the LGBTQ plus voters doubles from our model one, so they were much, much stronger. Uh, and it was quite obvious that the viability of the candidate was related to voter turnout. Uh, when a candidate was a viable candidate, uh, LGBTQ plus voters turned out. When they were non-viable candidates, they got they, their, their vote um, was, uh, was much, much lower than the, the winning candidate in the, the 20, 30, minus 20, minus 30 percent range. Uh, this tended to suppress LGBTQ plus candidate, or voter turnout. Hope you get all of that. Anyways, the takeaways from this is all uh, that LGBTQ plus voters are more inclined than other voters to turn out to vote, and that this turnout is uh, particularly related to the presence of LGBTQ plus candidates in their writing. So they're more likely to turn out when these candidates are there. However, uh, it very importantly, candidate viability uh, plays a role of in this turnout. So when it, it has a positive effect, this affinity between candidates and voters has a positive effect uh, when candidates are viable, and it empowers voters to become more engaged uh, and when there's a legitimate candidate running. Uh, but it also has a negative effect. If, if the candidate who's running is not a viable candidate, if they're a sacrificial lamb or if they're running for a fringe party, it reinforces a sense of out, being outsiders and non-legitimate political actors, and it further enhances decline in turnout. So I think our results speak to the value of candidate diversity as a means for him enhancing democratic engagement. Uh, it is, supports affinity arguments based on the empowerment versus linked fate uh, argument about uh, affinities. And it points to the need to look at other systematically marginalized groups, whether we're talking black, racialized or indigenous individuals to compare how these affinities work for them. Um, and I think that um, you know this all has an important uh, role to play when we talk about electoral integrity, because if we don't have voters turning out, then we don't have strong electoral systems representing the, the public concerns. And one way to ensure you have higher levels of turnout uh, or to, to support that higher levels of turnout is ensuring that you've got candidates that look like the diversity of the population. So I will leave it at that. Great paper, super interesting data. Thank you so much for, for your presentation. We will now move to the last uh, presentation of, of the night or day, depending when where you are. Um, just yeah, political nice. comedy work. Yes, right, whenever you're ready, yes. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I'm wondering how we can, okay. Just 
give me a moment to share my presentation. Okay, uh, please let me know if you can see my presentation. Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, so um, uh, now I'm going to present my paper, which is about the political comedy and how they affect the viewers' uh, political, political attitudes. Um, I'm talking about the uh, case of Iraq and how the political comedy uh, shows in Iraq uh, do that. Uh, I, I'm trying to compare the, uh, I try to compare the uh, effect of those shows uh, with the uh, established democracies uh, context also. So the goal and the question here is, um, again, revealing the impact of the political comedy shows in new democracies such as Iraq and how people um, react to those shows. The uh, main question here is, how do the political, uh, political comedy shows affect the public perception of politics in Iraq, uh, whether they are similar, how they, how they are similar, how they are different uh, from the, um, again, the established democracies. Uh, why Iraq, this is about the case. Um, so it is still under, under, uh, uh, under represent, represented in terms of exploring this, um, this type of uh, pol political um, impact in comparison to other countries in the same region, such as Egypt, Iran, Lebanon, etc. cetera. Uh, from 2005, which was the first uh, elections after the uh, uh, collapse of the Saddam Hussein regime, 2003. But the first election was in 2005, and the last election was uh, 2021. And the turnouts had declined from 70% to the 40s. There's a huge public distrust in the government, the, the uh, level depending on the uh, public, public opinions uh, surveys uh, show that the, there's a type of, I mean, there's a uh, huge percentage of distrust among the public about the government. And there is um, also uh, a public distrust about um, how the government handles the, uh, the, the situation in, the, in the, the country in terms of the mismatch between the GDP, the, the bad economy, the unemployment rates, etc. Again, uh, also, sorry, about the, uh, the protests of the uh, October 2019, which was the uh, the biggest uh, protests uh, in, in the country after 2003. Why do the shows matter in politics? Uh, they work the same, uh, similar way that the media does, but they use the humorous uh, coverage uh, in their content. And they try to uh, not all to be, uh, to, to be, uh, to the type of, to be a type of comedy, but also to, to be serious about certain things. And there is uh, another type of political comedy. It's called the political satire. It's more about being aggressive about the candidates, about the political condition, conditions and events uh, in, in the given country. Um, they matter uh, and they work as mediators between the viewers and their political engagement. Um, they are not non-traditional source of information. People, especially who are not very attracted to the news, to the uh, to, uh, to any political stories, they may find themselves enjoying watching a new uh, both shows and also uh, have uh, more political information. Uh, also, those shows frame the viewers uh, politically, and they develop the, the uh, viewers' negative attitudes towards the uh, policies and politicians. Political comedy shows and Mina. Uh, as you know, uh, MENA region is one of the regions, maybe uh, one of the highest regions that there is no, uh, or there's low level of freedom of speech. Because of that, almost all of the shows um, are outside of the original countries. Um, examples uh, are below, such as in uh, Iran, Palestine, Egypt. But in the case of Lebanon, uh, most of them are still there, depending on the uh, uh, domestic conditions uh, in the country. Also fear, fear of being persecuted because of challenging the current uh, political regime. And that has happened for many of those uh, shows. In the Iraqi context, um, uh, 
I tried to focus on two main um, shows. One of them is called the Milan City Show, started in 2015 and still going on. It, it, it had type of mix between the political and comedy uh, 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 show uh, situation uh, or, or type of uh, shows like political and social comedy, but they tried to uh, focus more on social comedy because of the uh, threats that they received from the militia, religious, and uh, tribal leaders. Uh, in terms of the other show, which is the one that I focus more, uh, it's, it's called the Al Bashir Show. It started in 2014 and is still uh, performing outside Iraq because uh, of being banned by the Iraqi government in 2016. And that show is the only one uh, in Iraq, uh, outside Iraq, but it's Iraqi show that explicitly criticizes the uh, religious, militia, political leaders, tribal leaders, uh, and political figures, etc. It is something um, no, no show for uh, that popularity among uh, especially the youth. Um, again, Italy criticizes the Iraqi militia religious leaders, uh, only the subscribers, not the followers here, there's a mistake. Um, uh, on Twitter, uh, depending depend on the account of that show, there are 3.7 million uh, subscribers on, um, on Twitter, 6.6 .6 on Facebook, and 7.2 uh, million on YouTube. I conducted the university in March 2022, um, why in Baghdad? Because uh, it's the capital, and it like people from different uh, demographic, demographic, geographic, and social, socioeconomic backgrounds live there. Um, Hello, uh, have we lost Fred or is it my connection? I can't hear him either, so I think we've lost his connection. Oh, I think, yeah, we, we just lost him. Um, he just dropped from the, the, from the panel. Oh, there he's back. <laughs> we, we can't hear you right now. I just saw you, you popped back in, but. You, you are muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, uh, I'm sorry if you missed some of the slides, but I will. Go back to the method and data in order not to miss uh, much, much of time. So again, I conducted a survey in a public university in Baghdad in March 2022. The sample size was uh, 138 participants, and I tried to uh, uh, to examine for variant depending uh, dependent variables such as voting, which is one of the uh, uh, variables, uh, whether the participants voted or not in the most recent elections of 2021, uh, the, they trust the government, uh, whether the shows speak on their behalf, because again, of, uh, the, the freedom of, spe of speech is very limited, and the expanding knowledge, if they try to look for, um, search for more information, information about the uh, the, uh, the stories that those shows talk about. And I tried to uh, uh, use some independent variables such as being exposed to those shows, uh, political interest in politics or the news in Iraq in general about Iraq, the preferred show, uh, because I had a list of shows, uh, but uh, I, I wanted to, to see w which of those is uh, highly uh, uh, watched by those uh, viewers. Source of uh, watching the shows like the online, uh, on TV, etc. The source of news, uh, newspapers, uh, um, TV, online interaction with the shows such as sharing, commenting, liking, etc. And the trust in the 
uh, political comedy shows, uh, which means uh, whether they, the viewers believe that the stories in those shows are real stories, they are not fake, not only for making people laugh, but it's also uh, reflecting the, uh, the current situation or the political situation in the country. And in terms of the demogra uh, demographics, I uh, try to uh, check the impact of sex, level of religiosity, and the fabric, which means whether the uh, respondent lives in a big city or in um, um, tribe dominated or religious dominated uh, city. I have four hypotheses. I uh, tried to see whether the viewers who trust and watch the shows more often are expected to have a low level of turnout. And, and in the elections, viewers who also trust and watch the uh, through comedy shows more often uh, are expected uh, to have a, a low level of trust in the government. And when the contents of the shows meet the viewers' uh, expectations, so the viewers feel that the shows talk on their behalf and finally expanding the political knowledge is expected to increase the uh, uh, increase for those who watch the shows more uh, frequent and trust them. Here are the results of the um, uh, of the uh, surveys or the model they I ran. Um, so I tried to uh, create uh, two variables. One is about the Elbashir show and one is about the uh, uh, city, uh, Milan city. These, those they were, they were the most frequent, uh, uh, the, the, the viewers frequently uh, uh, report that they watched more, uh, only those two uh, most of the time. Uh, in terms of the of voting, again, depending on the theory of the political comedy show, uh, uh, political comedy shows, those who are highly exposed to the shows uh, are less likely to, to participate in the uh, elections, which I have uh, like the 10% uh, significance here for both shows. Uh, also the trust in the, I mean, the news, those, there is a positive rela relationship between the watch, watching news and voting in the elections. Um, in terms of the trust in the government, there is uh, sex. I mean, males have high uh, rates of uh, uh, trust in the government as opposed to females. And in terms of the present, whether the shows represent the, the viewers, there is a, a positive relationship between trust in those shows and being uh, represented by those uh, shows. And finally, in terms of the um, knowledge, um, I have also the trust in the shows, uh, those who uh, have high level of trust in the shows, um, have high a level of knowledge and also expanding the, uh, and for, uh, uh, their knowledge about the, uh, the shows, there's a positive relationship between exposure to those shows, uh, and there's a negative relationship between the, uh, level of religiosity with that uh, variable. Uh, so again, uh, in terms of the uh, first hypothesis, uh, it, it was supported, but uh, on voting, Washington News had significant positive impact, which is sometimes, uh, is different from the uh, theory of that. Uh, hypothesis two was not supported, for three and four, uh, uh, supported um, by uh, some or all of the expected variables. Uh, other findings here are high trust in the uh, political comedy shows results in more voting, which is counterintuitive. Males have more trust in the government, also counterintuitive because males are most affected by the uh, high, high rate of unemployment, etc. cetera. Um, high level of logicity, uh, results in less expansion of knowledge, which is not surprising because again, political satire programs uh, try to uh, uh, to challenge the current uh, traditions and try to uh, break the uh, the eyes of uh, traditions. So those who have high level of religiosity try to uh, not to be affected by those shows. So these are the main. Uh, um, findings. Thank you for uh, listening and I will appreciate any feedback.